eight months ago when I sat down with Randy to talk about what might be a good topic, he said disciplined agile sounds intriguing and asked if I could put together a presentation for, for the group of analysts. It's, it's a topic I am passionate about, but to condense it into 45 minutes might be a little bit of a challenge, but we're going to try and go there. The next th thing he told me was that I would be following a magic act. Now, <laughs> I love magic, <laughs> just like anybody else, but following a master of illusion certainly got into my head a little bit. <laughs> I didn't have any magic prepared for my presentation, but maybe we'll see that Agile is the magic. To begin, I'd like to ask you to imagine. Imagine a world where your kids put away their laundry, finish their homework, and complete their chores before asking for video game time. Imagine a world where you return home from the grocery store and you set the bags on the counter and as your wife begins putting them away, she pulls your chin closer to hers and she says, you remembered everything. Imagine a world where your coworkers complete their tasks on time, under budget, and delighting the customer with a high value solution, giving them a competitive edge. These are worlds that we want to live in. What makes them so impossible to imagine? I'll tell you that each one of them has a common problem. The people involved view the tasks as either too difficult, poorly defined, or just hard to complete. So you have to shrink the change. That's what Agile is all about. Those are supposed to activate sooner. <laughs> so what we'd like to cover tonight is a little bit more about my background so you understand my perspective. What is Agile? We'll spend some time defining what it means to be Agile. How does it work in practice? Why should you care as a business analyst or as a father or as a husband? And in the end, we'll wrap up with everything that we just talked about. So as I said, I'm a husband first. And what that means is I've been married for 14 years to a beautiful, loving, and supportive, and patient wife, Tracy. And I did mention I'm not a magician, but my kids tell me I can make a whole room full of people disappear with my jokes. I'm a father next. My oldest son, Ace, is really big into sports. I've blessed him with the curse of being a Lions fan. My middle son, Dax, is just a people person. He's got an incredible amount of emotional intelligence. And my youngest child is my daughter, Tegan, and she just has a general love for life. So with this all-star cast, I'm really set up well for success. Now, as a team lead, I've had quite a, few, quite a diverse experience in the IT industry. I started about 17 years ago at the Sigmund Group, which is a defense contractor down in Virginia Beach, Virginia. A lot of the work they did was government contracts. I then moved on into my software career at Rapid Parts, where I started as a junior developer and worked all the way up to senior developer and eventually a tech lead. In the last couple of years, I've taken on a role as a software team lead at a local company in Grand Rapids, Fiennes Alstrom. Well, what does it mean to be a team lead? It's a position where I get to mentor software developers and fill the role of an agile coach to a software team. You saw my name, but you should also know that I care about certifications. Sometimes people balk at them, I get that. But in my IT career, I've earned BizTalk, Google Analytics, Microsoft certifications, NetPlus, Sitecore. I was recently an ordained minister and this year performed my first wedding. And for the purposes of this talk, you should know that I'm a disciplined, agile yellow belt. Now, you might see a pattern here. What I'm really going for is an entire alphabet of certifications. So if you know how I can get certified as a zookeeper, make sure you get my contact information. All right, diving right in. What is Agile? Agile is a set of methodologies that are designed to deliver value to customers early and often. Well, what does that look like? 20 years ago, I'll tell you that 17 software engineers met in Utah to do a little bit of skiing and talk about projects that have failed and projects that have succeeded. And what they decided to do was put together the, the lowest common denominator on the projects that succeeded so that they can find their way out of the document heavy projects that were doomed to fail. What they came up with is a list of principles that help guide their decision making. They value individuals and interactions 
over process and tools. They value working software over a comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. And if we break those down a little bit deeper, there's actually 12 principles that kind of guide the day-to-day -day and project-to-project -project interactions. The most important principle is that they place a high priority on satisfying the customer, again, through that early and continuous delivery of software. That principle is important because it's more than just about an individual's ego or following a plan. Agile puts delivery up of value above everything else. And you're gonna see this, this theme in different forms throughout the rest of the presentation because it really is the core of what Agile provides. Now, principle two is about welcoming change, being adaptable, even late in development. That might seem counterintuitive, but it's that process that allows you to harness the, the value and, and make the comp allow the customer's product to be competitive, whether it's software or, or any other product. What I think of when I think about adapting to change, I, I go back to one of my favorite cartoons as a kid, a 1973 Disney movie called Robin Hood. And what you see is that the sheriff of Nottingham is working on a traditional project, except it took so long for the arrow to get there that he missed his target and even made Marion's unhappy with the results. Of course, Robin Hood steps up in disguise because he's actually an agilist and he sets off on track, but they realize they need to change direction mid-course. Fortunately, as an Agilist, he, his, his framework is built to handle change, and he's able to stay on target, shattering Sheriff Nottingham's. The animal crowd goes crazy, Maid Marian falls deeper in love, and even Prince John approves. Principle three is about delivering working software frequently from iterations that span a couple of weeks or a couple of months with a preference towards the shorter time scale. And this really complements the first principle about releasing early and often, which in another way might mean failing fast, but that's okay because failure is fuel for success. Would you rather be wrong about a decision now or three months from now? That's what I think of when, when, when we talk about principle three and delivering software frequently and in a shorter time scale. The faster you can get to a minimum viable product, the faster you validate your learning. Principle four is about collaboration. Business people and developers work together frequently throughout the project. Removing silos. In Agile, you don't throw work over the aisle hoping that the other team will get it. Agile, when it's effective, means that teams know that the success of the project is directly related to the proximity of everybody involved. Analysts, customers, project sponsors, the whole team. Developing strong relationships with the people involved is how you ensure that accountability. Principle five is a lot about trust. You're gonna build projects around motivated individuals and then give them an environment that, that caters to getting the job done. I'm gonna guess some of you have probably worked with a slacker before. That guy that's always in the break room getting coffee or seems to find some excuse why he couldn't complete his tasks. Successful teams sometimes require management to take the necessary steps to make sure that the right people are on the bus and the right people are in the right seat. I once worked with a manager who said, if I hear you talking, then you must not be working. When I walk down your aisle, I should only hear the sound of your fingers on the, key, on the keyboard. There was no trust. And without trust, there can be no healthy conflict, no ownership, no accountability. And that means no results. Principle six is about face-to-face, -face, preference of face-to-face -face communication. When do you check your email? 8 a.m., only after 3 p.m. on Thursdays? Or maybe you prefer Teams, Slack, or SMS text messages. There is no shortage of electronic mediums for which we can botch our communication. Even when you use all caps or bold or italic text, you're missing the context that face-to-face -face communication provides. They say that upwards of 80% of perceived communication is nonverbal. Body language, inflection, tone, these are all key for understanding the customer, understanding the stakeholders, and understanding your team. 
In these days of Zoom and teleconferences, when you can't be present in person, I would strongly encourage you to keep the video on. Seeing each other's posture and facial expressions can speak volumes, and it's a way to pay respect to the people that you're working with. Principle seven, again, complementing principle one, is about getting working software into the hands of the customer because that is your primary measure of success. Not defects, not completed work items, not hours logged against the project. Nothing is more important to an agile team than the early and continuous delivery of value. And it's measured by a working product. Principle eight is about sustainability. Processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should all be able to maintain that pace indefinitely. It's why it's important to limit work in progress. If you don't, then you risk burning out your team members and that can lead to quality issues in the end product. Principle nine is about an attention to, to excellence. As part of the iterative style of development and through frequent team retrospectives, Agile teams take time to pay down technical debt, adopt industry standards, and develop best practices. Software teams I work with, for example, do frequent code reviews so that everybody on the team becomes a generalist and is accountable for what is shipped. Simply put, quality products are easier to maintain. Principle 10 is about simplicity. It's the art of maximizing work that's not done. It's essential. This involves releasing the highest value items as quickly as possible. And sometimes that does mean the more complex pieces first, rather than pushing the hard stuff out to the horizon. Think about how many times you've told yourself, this Saturday, I'm gonna attack the garage. I'm gonna clean the whole thing. Did you do it? Probably not. Same reason your kids have a hard time focusing on all the chores they have to do before they're allowed to play video games. It feels like too much and you don't know where to start. You just end up not doing it. Breaking work into smaller chunks helps build confidence in the team and it embraces principle one, delivering value early and often. Principle 11 is about the architecture and requirements and designs that come from self-organizing teams. To me, this made me think about high school when somebody tells you, a teacher tells you, all right, Shane, you're you know, the captain of the first dodgeball team. Brett, you're the second one. And you have to go through that list and, and pick people that have the strong arms and are cool or whatever that whole political process is of, of finding and building the right team for the next 30 minutes. Well, what if your team members were allowed to, students were allowed to pick their own teams? Honestly, you'd probably end up with a team of strong-armed cool kids versus a team of uncoronated kids nursing bloody noses. And I'm allowed to say that because I was a kid with a bloody nose. Self-organizing teams are more efficient than the command and control assignment model that we've seen in traditional project management. The final principle is about creating a culture where you take time to reflect on what's working. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective, allowing them to eliminate waste. We'll get into this a little bit deeper in a few slides, but this is where the core of the magic on an agile team happens, that you're taking time to reflect on what, the, what you should be starting, stopping, or continuing. That's the agile principles and manifesto in a nutshell. Now we're gonna move on to how it's actually applied. What does it look like to, to practice agile? Bruce Lee says that he doesn't fear the man who's practiced 10,000 kicks once, but he fears the man who's practiced one kick 10,000 times. And to me, that quote is about refining the process to, to adapt it to be more efficient at delivering value. Like a boxer getting coached between rounds, Agile has these built-in checkpoints allowing you to adjust your strategy to what makes sense for the team or the project. Originally, when I wrote this presentation and, and worked with Randy, I was a yellow belt in the disciplined Agile Consortium. And since, since March, they've actually merged into PMI, the Project Management Institute. But both certification programs and, and, and both organizations will tell you that there's no one right way to do Agile. 
it's, it's a hybrid that builds upon the foundation of different methods so you can take the pieces that work for you. Whether it's Scrum, which is the most popular, Extreme Programming, Kanban, I believe Safe is a popular one, Lean, where you do exploratory development. There's, there's really a lot of them. And the idea is that there's, again, no prescriptive method that's gonna work for everybody. If you've ever traveled to Chicago, maybe you've stayed around the, the, miracle, is it the Millennium Mile and the hotel's like right downtown and you wanna go to maybe Second City to catch a, a, a comedy show. You're not gonna be able to just take the train. You might have to take a scooter to get on the train to then take an Uber to save a few bucks for the last mile to get to Second City. You're gonna do what makes sense to get from A to B and Agile supports the same process. Scrum lays down a solid framework for people, but they're gonna take the parts that work from the other Agile methodologies. Disciplined Agile or the ACP program through the PMI is really just the mortar that helps glue these bricks together. So what, is, what does it look like to actually use these in practice on a team for a project? Well, the spirit of Agile is that in something they call iteration zero, the entire team gets together, they make a list of what needs to be done, they then start to size things up on what's gonna be more complex or more simple. And then with the customer and the product owner, they're gonna start setting priorities on what actually needs to get done first and will deliver the most value quickly. And then the team begins executing. It's all about the iterative incremental approach as opposed to just trying to knock the entire thing out of the park. When, when you think about estimating this type of project, you might know that developers are really bad at estimation. Doing so at the front of the project is, is rarely accurate. There's different technologies, different people, different requirements. No two projects are alike. It's asking me, it's like asking me how long it's gonna take me to get the groceries. I couldn't tell you. I swear every time I'm there, Meyer moves the aisle that the peanut butter's on. But over time, as the team executes on the development and a velocity is established, it becomes more reliable and you're able to better predict feature completion. And you do it in a way that's actually not too different than a traditional or what's sometimes known as a waterfall style of project management. In, in Deming's version, you have the plan, do, check, act life cycle. In Agile, you really do the same thing, but with a focus on doing it quicker so that you can adjust. You remember the golden arrow competition? Robinhood was able to course correct to stay on target. Agile bakes that into its process. And with the most successful Agile process, the most popular at least, Scrum, the wheels of the PDCA cycle are greased by frequent and open communication. Communication is rarely easy. In fact, it's difficult for most people. Scrum addresses this through built-in checkpoints in the project lifestyle cycle that help keep the team on track. So what is that team? What do they look like? Well, you're gonna have a, a customer and that could be internal or external. You're gonna have a, a product owner who is the voice of the customer and is gonna help maintain the backlog and keep priority surface to the top. And they really have the final say on acceptance testing as well. Ideally, you have an agile coach, somebody who's just there to help eliminate waste and keep the team moving along. And then there's the development team. And again, this, this is kind of written and leaning towards software development, but it, it doesn't have to be. The team is a self-organizing group of generalists. There might be specialists on the team. However, every team member should be able to edit each other's code so that you will achieve a higher quality result in a shorter time. Ideally, the product owner and the agile coach are individual roles held by individual people, and they're not shared responsibilities with other people on the development team, but that's gonna really depend on the company you work for and the team size. So this is a, a map of what it looks like to do development in a project for, that's based on Scrum. You've got the product owner who's again working with the customer to address the product backlog. And initially the team's gonna be working alongside them as well. Those checkpoints that I talked about are the sprint planning, the daily standups, which you try to keep short and concise, sprint reviews and sprint retrospectives. And those usually handle, are handled at the end of the iteration. Originally, Scrum was developed with the idea that it should be a four-week or a month-long cycle. However, in practice, most teams that I've worked with 
find that two weeks is that sweet spot. So you end up taking the planning activity from a day down to anywhere from two hours to four hours sometimes. Again, the activities of the product owner and the customer are that they're going to groom and address the priority and the acceptance tests of a product backlog and continue to do discovery on what it looks like to have a valuable working product. While inside of the iterations, the dev team is just gonna focus on the iteration backlog, the work they can commit to in that, let's say two week cycle. They can choose to prioritize it differently if it makes sense to deliver value, that's up to them at that point. And this cycle is gonna continue until the discovery activities outweigh the value that's being delivered. A dev team or other product team might choose to use a Kanban board to help visualize the work in progress. Kanban stems from the Japanese word meaning signboard or billboard. It's a common way to represent the, the work in progress and tools like Jira, Trello, Microsoft has DevOps. These are all things that help you visualize the progress and they can be connected to dashboards that act as information radiators for the product owner or other stakeholders to know where the team is at at any given time. They also help address accountability. If a ticket is stuck in a column for too long, you know that's something called an agile smell and somebody's gonna have to deal with why is this stuck? Is a person roadblocked? Is the person lazy? But this gives you that ability to visualize that, that problem and address it. I also think about this when I think about my days as a short order cook. And there were few things more gratifying than taking that last ticket off the rail and spiking it down on the counter and saying, order up, because that finished a successful food service. Agile is great for teams, but disciplined agile goes as far as framing how it can fit in the broader company ecosystem. And I'm not gonna to spend too much time on this slide, but disciplined agile aims to address agile methodologies beyond just the development team, because it's, it's really not that great if it's only one team that's adopting it. And every organization is unique. There is no one size fits all for doing Agile. Agile works because it allows you to optimize the whole. It starts the development team and then ideally it spreads to IT and then you have DevOps and other components of your organization may adopt it as well. Looking at this though, it actually just reminds me of a, a map of Middle Earth. So it can be a little confusing. <laughs> All right, so why does Agile matter to me? Why should you care? Well, at least in my experience, on most teams, the business analyst is the product owner. So at work, that means you're the voice of the customer. At home, it means you control the remote. And in a relationship, relationship well, well, my wife still wears the pants, but technically I bought them, so I'm still kind of the product owner. I'd like to share with you a couple stories about my experience to wrap things up about working on a traditional team, working on an agile team that was new to the process and still transforming, as well as the, some of the successes I've seen when we actually had analysts helping us out. In my time at the Sigma Group, a lot of our projects were defined by customers before we even bid on them. That meant the customer was distant and requirements were essentially documented in a vacuum without collaboration. Some negotiation would occur and hopefully we'd win the bid, but it would be months before a deliverable was produced. If it didn't meet the customer's requirements, it might become an issue of compromise or negotiation to try and find what success should look like. Or oftentimes the requirements had changed, and so the original project was just simply holding less value. We found that it became increasingly difficult to measure the value we were providing some of our customers beyond just checking off the boxes of the project. But I do believe you can find success just reading up on Agile and allowing it to slowly creep into your project life cycle. But it can be daunting if you don't have the commitment from your team or organization. Fortunately, a few years later, I moved on to Rapid Parts, where in the early days, Agile was kind of awkward. It felt forced. I was just a junior dev on the team, and I was really only working with one other team member at the time. And I would just flip my chair around to face them every morning at 8.30 to a sleepy intern who was just kind of trying to get through the day. And it really didn't even make sense to talk about what we were gonna be doing because 
we were going to be paired up most of the time anyway, because like I said, he was kind of sleeping most of the time. When our young agile team finally took on its first company wide software migration project, agile really started to shake things up. Now remember, Agile helps eliminate waste. And there was an IT manager whose daily standup was, his message was the same every day for about three weeks. The four words, nothing on my end. Well, he proved to be redundant and his Agile experience had him finding a new job quickly. Years went by and other projects came and went. And we were still missing something about the Agile process. There was a sense that we never really knew if we were working on the right thing. Bugs would come in and essentially have equal priority amongst other features because developers are great at solving problems with lines of code, but they're not always great at zooming out and seeing the big picture. Eventually the team grew. We added more developers, we hired our first business analyst, and we finally got a voice of the customer, a person dedicated to helping us measure value and balance priority. Next, we invested in Agile training from a gentleman named Scott Ambler at the Disciplined Agile Consortium. Now, we had all the people and all the resources we need for success. Through a series of training sessions, team building exercises, and quizzes, our team was finally feeling Agile. Our, pro our process and tools catered our methodologies as well. We could finally release tested code early and often to the delight of our customers the kind of magic which may only be possible through Agile and with the help of our business analyst. Product owners. All right, so why does this matter? Well, business analysts, they know the domain, the business domain. They are closer to the features and requirements because they know the customer. So I would say as a business analyst, your goal is to help the team deliver that value and Agile provides a framework to make that delivery possible, engaging, and some might even say magical. So in conclusion, if you are a family man trying to curb behaviors of your children, or if you are a fox archer facing off against Sheriff Nottingham in the Golden Arrow competition, or if you're just working on a team which is struggling to deliver value, consider shrinking the change, defining success in small iterations, and embrace an agile approach. May your teams always find a way to keep focus on delivering value. And if you by chance know somebody who can certify me as a zookeeper, please send them my contact information. Thank you. Thanks, Shane. Appreciate it. Very, very great presentation. All the way from Chicago to zookeeping to short order cooking and <laughs> all kinds of things there. Thank you. Uh, group, what kind of questions do you have for Shane? I did say there might be magic. So if I can't answer the question, I do have an eight ball with me that I can consult. <laughs> so if we want to learn more about this one, Agile, what would be a good book to pick up and read? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, Disciplined Agile has an introductory book. I, the name of it's slipping me right now, but it's something that came with the training that, that we took. It, it goes a lot of places. So I don't know that one book alone is really gonna do it. Uh, I do believe that the, the ACP class, Don, that you and I took um, was, was really beneficial. And that was really just a course that was how to pass the exam. Right. But I felt like it really touched on a lot of great concepts and they have a book on their uh, website as well. All right, thanks. And that's through the PMI, right? When you're talking yes. about the ACP. Yeah, that's, that's uh, been the process, I think, for about a dozen years. And like I said, they recently acquired some, some sort of partnership with the Disciplined Agile Consortium. And so I think that it just shows that they're just adopting some of the strategies and approach that, that DAD uh, has taken. And I gotta say, as somebody who teaches some of the project management classes, you had great timing on that video. That was awesome. <laughs> which, which, which video are you referring to? With the Nottingham, with the arrows oh. and stuff? That was awesome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I practiced it with my kids a few times. There you go. I'll go with the magic. You had, you had there, and, and it's a shame we didn't have the magic act, but it just wouldn't have been the same virtually. No, I would have been forced to actually come up with some sort of real life in-person magic, I think. <laughs>
Though it would have been interesting to see a room full of analysts dissect a magician's uh, act to see uh, if you guys could find exactly where that card came from. Figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> We'd have to ask why five times, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Can you speak a little bit about, um, I know you you were very passionate in your, you know, summary of the presentation about, you know, working with uh, BAs. Can you summarize a little bit, you know, what, why you find that we help the developers and a little bit around that to kind of talk a little bit about the role, like in this new way of doing things, sometimes there's a perception that, BA and POs are kind of different and one is not the other and maybe BA is not there. So what right. is your experience? How, how? <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. My experience has certainly been that we, our team really accelerated once we had a product, a, a, a business analyst who was functionally the, the product owner, because without that person, a, a, a developer lead or a project manager on the development team is wearing a hat on a hat on a hat. And it becomes really challenging to switch context between those and to, to, to go down and solve problems again with lines of code, but then to pop back up and think about the whole. Whereas a, biz, a dedicated business analyst gave us that and they, they were essentially the quarterback. At times I thought I was the quarterback on the development team, but over time I realized that I was just that, that all-star wide receiver that he could quick shuttle the ball to. <laughs> um, right. So, yeah, having somebody that's, that's always got their eyes on the backlog and their ears to the customer helps us make sure that we're working on the, the right thing at the right time. Mm -hmm. Yep, thank you. Yeah, that is a, a topic we hear about is that uh, the, a lot of people that are becoming product owners uh, are not you know, realizing that they're performing basically BA tasks as product owners. And uh, it's just, you know, Agile is taking and, and, and can and basically taking a B, a business analyst and, and having him do business analyst activities, but get more involved directly with the customer and managing some things over there. So at least that's yeah. my perception. I, and I agree with that too. The, the, the team that I'm currently working with at Fines Alstra is going through an agile transformation as well. You might notice I didn't have a slide in there about that team because we, we don't have a product owner. We don't have a business analyst. When, when bugs or features come in, everything has equal priority. So everything is always on fire. And one of my roles in working with that team and, and, and being that agile coach is to help kind of pump the brakes and put in some processes that allow us to have governance, accountability, and give the, the IT manager an opportunity to help prioritize these things so that the devs don't feel like they're always putting out fires. And so as, so as I understand, Discipline Agile is like another flavor of something similar, for example, of SAFE, right? Like it would be another framework, another... Yeah, I don't think I did a good job explaining that, actually. Uh, Disciplined Agile is an, is an umbrella concept that says whether you use SAFE or Scrum or Kanban or any of these other more specific frameworks, uh, Disciplined okay. Agile says Agile has value even if you only take part of Scrum. You're only doing the daily stand-ups. Even if you're doing pieces part of, of XP. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I think that was to me what the acquisition for PMI represented is that they're they're not trying to prescribe Scrum or Safe or Kanban or any of those right, other ones as right. much as saying they all might work or one individual one might work. Use the right tool for the job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nice. Cool. Any other uh, questions? Anybody else a fan of Robin Hood? Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad they remastered it on Disney Plus because it actually looks pretty good. That was a great illustration. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, um, at one quick question, actually. Sorry to turn off my video. This is Kevin. Um, Wi-Fi and wireless has been a little bit iffy today. I was wondering, actually, um, our Scrum teams have been struggling a little bit um, with prioritization that's happening above the product owner and BA level. I was kind of wondering if you had any advice um, 
from the prioritization kind of uh, from coming upstream. Um, so we have in, in our kind of uh, flow, we have experienced owners that flow down to product owners. And then obviously our um, business analysts um, assist those product owners. Um, but in terms of priority, um, a lot of times uh, it ends up just being one large waterfall project that <laughs> um, work is done in just sprints. So I'm wondering um, in terms of like a top-down approach, um, what advice do you have for um, a business analyst to start maybe pushing um, or, or how to handle that scenario where uh, our dev teams are, are doing great um, and doing the agile uh, practice, uh, practices or scrum practices are, are being done uh, perfectly well uh, from the outside, but um, all the work that's flowing down is painting a different story and, and forcing a lot of stress in that fire drill situation. Sure. I think I've heard that called scrum fall. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of this we call it uh, we call it dearly fragile. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. That's a good one. Is let me ask you this, Kevin. Is is are the changes coming at a pace where they're asking analysts or the team to shift course mid mid iteration or mid sprint, or is it more like just mid release? Uh, both um, both occur, and the problem is that we have one large target date. So when we ask what needs to be deprioritized, uh, there is nothing to be deprioritized. It's just added scope consistently um, is usually the problem. I think in the book Essentialism, they start off by defining priority because it didn't actually have a plural until the early 1900s. Um, priority just meant the main focus. And all of a sudden, us industrialized American society has to make it a list. And then it's really hard to balance priority, right? <laughs> I think in, in that situation, what, what, what I've come to experience is that when those types of changes happen, obviously the product owner is usually kind of the gatekeeper and helps insulate the dev team in some ways of that shift and try to bring uh, clarity and balance to what, what the customer is actually asking for. But if they don't really know what they're asking for, or they keep changing what they're asking for. One thing that I've seen work really well is to, to, to find some way of measuring the change that they're asking for. For example, when I worked at Rapid Parts on an e-commerce product, they, different, different team managers would say, we really need to work on you know, the way people do returns, or we really need to work on the way the shopping cart looks. And if they couldn't prove that that was going to tie to a dollar amount, we, we, we were at least able to have the conversation that says our Google Analytics account or our, our, our app monitoring shows that this is how users actually behave. And then we can start putting a, a dollar amount on the different features that they were asking for, that, that perceived value of the change that they wanted. And, and that helped us have different conversations. So essentially leading up with, with data, because even though people don't usually make emotional decisions, data can sometimes help change the tide a little bit. Okay. I put my alien face on because I guess it brings up another question is, in, in your upline management chain, have they agreed to do Agile? And if they have not yet agreed to do Agile, then they're, they're, and they're doing things the same old way. But if they've agreed to do Agile, maybe they just need to be educated on what Agile really is. Yeah, I think the education portion is probably key. So uh, one, thank you, Shane, for that, because we do not have that. We do not have uh, value specifically tied to each of the features or epics that is trickling down to our projects. So we don't have good metrics to be able to hold or have accountability prior to that work entering the workflow. Um, and additionally, from the agile training perspective, um, I don't, I can't necessarily speak on how well that is going, but um, in terms of the work that does flow down to us um, and the methods that it is, um, that it currently is flowing down to us, I would say that it's a little rough. Um, but the whole kind of structure and hierarchy uh, between um, leadership, management, whatever you want to call it, uh, makes it a little tough for anyone um, on the de uh, development team to be able to speak um, to that weakness. Um, so it's a little bit of a precarious position, I would say. Um, Adoption is certainly key in that scenario. The, the other thing too, though, is if, even if you don't have the tools or the ability to, to put dollar amounts or values on the work that they're asking for to help them really fine tune the prioritization, you could also uh, do it you know, build dashboards or just run reports to get information around what is that, what is the cost with having them change gears, right? And that could come from mm -hmm. the velocity reports maybe or burn down charts or one of those, one of those other types of uh, tools 
that Jira or are you guys using something like Jira? Yep, yep we use Jira. Yep. Okay. Yeah, there's there's a, a ton of great charting tools in there that that help you see uh, velocity and I mean, it's, I know it's a relative point system in most organizations, but it should still help you have a conversation that says this type of shifting is is allowing is just destroying our velocity, and so we're not able to really deliver any value. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks. And Kevin, are you also uh, having with uh, the things that they're, you're sounding like they have a pro? It's more of a project that they've got going on. They're trying to put it in, in chunks of work rather than truly uh, trying to, and then changing when they want each one done in priority order. Is it more that kind of thing? Kind of. And then there's always kind of a big bang launch date. And that's always, uh, you know, or there's yeah. always some things that fall through the cracks and then it ends up kind of falling into that agile fall type deal. Especially yeah. Towards the end of it. So. yeah. I think, uh, I, I have had the luxury of working on teams and projects where we did commit to a, a project charter, much like a traditional project. There's sometimes agile teams will put together, here's how we communicate and here's what we're going to allow to happen, you know, as far as we don't allow changes to happen mid sprint or we, we only do under these circumstances. And then ideally, you know, people sign it or I'll agree to it. That way there is that, that ownership and accountability because if changes keep happening like that, it's really going to shatter that the trust and, and again, that whole hierarchy of trust, accountability, ownership results. Right. Right. Yep. And I think uh, kind of the suggestions you made will be, will be more powerful. Uh, we do have the charters and everything, but again, it is a little bit of a, a sticky situation when it's your managers or uh, you know, the, the business, the product owners, managers that are approaching the team with changes um, just because of the, you know, um, downline relationship and, um, those types of things as well that are incorporated there. So yeah, uh, but I'll definitely take those uh, lessons. Um, yeah, Mahela. Yeah, I was going to say, Kevin, I've seen that also in our organization where because of other things or whatever dynamics and things and people get used to, they slide these, you know, small little requests and you go to the board and like, there's no card for this. How did this ever happen? Right. So yeah. I think you're right. Part of that is a, uh, you know, familiarity with the PO or the relationships with the, you know, manager and hierarchy. So um, I, I don't know really how those can be solved other than I think as a BA, I would say that if I don't have a card for something, it means I don't have a requirement. So for me to like, what are you building, Kevin, right? The developer. <laughs> so I think maybe in my case, I, I find like getting them back to, hey, create a card for this. I know, okay, you're in the middle of this, but at least it's visible. And then as you start, you know, counting those, you, you, you kind of see a trend. And I think to your point, Shane, if you have statistics or data about something, it's like, well, there's a trend. Why are we doing this? And how can we remediate maybe? Easy to say, I don't know, but, yeah. uh, you know, no card, no requirement, right? Yeah. Why yeah. are we doing so. I, on the, on another point, too, is that I, it took me a while to ac accept this. It's a false belief I've had about people in, in life is that, some people, I used to think like anybody could be convinced. I just had to find the right way to convince them that, you know, their actions were, were destabilizing or something like that. But I now no longer believe that. And sometimes there's just people at key, pe at key positions in an organization that just won't be able to embrace Agile and, and respect the, the rituals required and, and the, the discipline required to make it effective. Yeah, and I think we, you know, there's also an educational piece to it, like, you know, when you're on the business side and you're busy doing your business things, you know, you don't necessarily like we're passionate, you're passionate about that. You know? And some of us here as well as how do we do things better, right? Uh, but that's not their business, right? So how can we keep uh, educating? Maybe it's a big word, but how can we have some sort of cheat sheets or something that can help them understand, hey, when you say this, I really mean that. Right. Because I don't think sometimes they don't have the time or the or the even the passion to go in and try to understand what is IS doing in this agility. Right. Uh, so it's a combination of things, I think. But um, yeah, that's exactly yeah. what it feels like, actually. So um, but I think I think yeah. it would just it's good to take little steps. Um, so making sure we have our analytics straight to be able to paint the picture at first and then let them interpret that and just continuously. Uh, moving from there. I'm just, I know this is a pretty common problem for a lot of people. I just like to hear uh, different people's perspectives on it. Um, 
it is something we face. So it's something that we, I try to incorporate those lessons as, as much as possible. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I just pointed a link to Don, your earlier question about reading up on this. I, I didn't find a lot of value in some of the books that I I try to get into, but this site really paints that that picture really well and does what you were talking about as far as kind of mapping, like this role means this in an agile world and this process might look like this in an agile world. It's a lot to read through though. <laughs> Right, and that's and it may may not be like if they if 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 they said hey we're going to do agile they may not know what they're actually agreeing to, and so sometimes it's just a re-education. They've done things the same way all the time, and nobody likes change. It's not easy, so they're going to be resistant to that. And like the scrum master, they all got to go up and say, you know, that's kind of their job to go back and be the bad guy to the above people above them and go, okay, this is kind of how we're doing things. Here's where we can put that in. This is what this is going to look like. Here's how the process is going to work. And just be like a broken record, like you do with your kids. I have a dog, so I have to do it with my dog. But, you know, kids are kind of the same. <laughs> I live in a 3D world now. <laughs> you're ever, you're, are you are agile. You are changing yeah, you all are. over the place. <laughs> I'm with the theme, baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun, right? Because it's the agile word just makes it sound like we're going to be able to go to go to market quicker, or we're going to be able to um, do things faster. And, and, and in some ways, that's certainly true. That's what the focus is on is delivering value quickly. But and when it comes to software development, we, we end up having to put processes in place to, to make that possible. And sometimes it means automated testing, continuous builds, uh, we, pull requests is something that we do that where everybody gets their eyes on the code and has to approve it before it goes out. And to people that are new to Agile, specifically with software development, that feels like you're actually slowing things down because it's hard to measure the, the quality that comes out on the other end unless you're doing things like putting dollar amounts on, on values. But even then, it's hard to say like, well, see, look, we had no bugs because that was kind of the expectation in the first place, right? <laughs> well, as you say, I think a lot of people think that Agile doesn't have a bunch of processes, but it actually is a a framework and has a lot of of things involved in formality even though they try to make you think that it doesn't but it has a lot of formality in in process and so it it's good to be uh, it, it it's hard to partially buy in <laughs> to any framework and have it work yeah so, what's important is that you is that your team adapts to what what is working in it and throws out yeah yeah Right. Any other uh, questions on this or any other topic that we uh, would want to talk about here th uh, this evening? We have time. Not that I'm going to just take the time tonight. We we have uh, you know another half hour if we want to keep going. But uh, uh, we'll uh, just want to throw out the topics while we're gathered together. If there's things you want to talk about. I'll, I'll throw one other thing out there. You you mentioned a little earlier on about. Uh, having business business analysts getting involved in different ways when you're talking about the November content. Mm -hmm. uh, I do, I, I do a lot of work with Toastmasters clubs in the area. And if there's any analysts that have a, a nice, see, we only go five to seven minutes, Randy, uh, a nice five to seven minute speech that they would enjoy giving to some, some Toastmasters clubs. Uh, most of them have, all of them really have gone online as well. And you might find that they are hosting some pretty solid Zoom meetings. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if you feel like uh, brushing off some communication skills or, or just sharing some of the things you're passionate about with business an analysis, uh, I'm sure any of the clubs around here would, would be excited to have you as a guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you. given the opportunity if anybody has any last minute things here. I just want to say thank you guys for letting us come play. Thank you, Shane, for inviting us. They might be mad at you now, but. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm really <laughs> mad at Shane right now. It's just my mad face. <laughs> <laughs> I can't animate, though. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for joining us. And yeah, thank, thank you. It's been really nice. Yeah. yeah, and thank you again, Shane, for the presentation and for your insight as well and the questions and answers afterward here. We're uh, really thankful you were able to join us and wish it would have been in person. We were we missed that opportunity. 
uh, at least I had the privilege of being able to have a meal with you before all this and get to know you there. But, <laughs> but thank you for that. And, and thank you guys for the questions. And, and uh, we, as I said, we continue to have these meetings. We're going to have one in November. It's just going to be a discussion. And we, we have about four to five presentations a year, like what Shane did. Uh, and, uh, and then we're ha we try to have another two to three, four meetings where we, it's just basically an open forum time box to, to discuss things that are pertinent to how we do our job. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of our community. We're just here to be with each other, to learn from each other, serve each other, uh, do what we can to advance each other's careers and lives. So uh, thank you for taking the time to be with us this evening. We appreciate it. And you have a good evening. Yep, thank you. Hope Thanks, to see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay, how do I shut off the recording?